Cindy, welcome to the podcast. Great. Thanks, Casey. Well, Cindy, I was really excited to get introduced to you because you're doing some really amazing things in the women's retirement space, specifically with Wiser, uh, with a Women's Institute for a Secure Retirement. And this is something that we encounter day in and day out in our business, women either not being involved in the finances or actually taking over the finances. It seems like there's some major shifts going on when it comes to women's finance and women's retirement today. And you have made this boy, almost a life's mission, it seems. You've been doing this for about 25 years. I I was wondering, you know, right off the top, what is it that makes you so passionate about women's retirement issues? Well, I'll start with the uh, long story short. Um, I worked for a company for 15 years and um, I was involved. It was an airline. I worked, you know, with the union and whatever. And, um, they froze the the retirement plan and it was one of the first ones to be frozen. So this was back in the eighties and a lot of the, you know, my fellow colleagues thought that, you know, the company was trying to hide some big thing from us and nobody would tell us what it meant to have a frozen pension. Um, And so, you know, I started asking around, asking around, and I was friends with a bunch of the lawyers over, you know, at the airline office and, None of them could explain any of it either. So at some point, you know, that just sort of stuck in my head. And someone said to me, get out of this company because it's not going anywhere. It'll go out of business, which it did. And, you know, you're young enough. You can, like, do something else. So I went to law school. I ended up getting a a fellowship to Washington. And I thought I'd be here a year. I've now been here, like, 32 years. Um, So it just shows you, you know, (laughs) how those those plans, you know, evolve. Um, and, and so I kept asking about it. And even, you know, when I got my fellowship, you had a choice of what you wanted to work on. So I chose retirement. I figured mm. maybe I'll find out, you know, I'm going to put that pension in the freezer. And, you know, I guess when I'm 65, I'll take it out. I don't know. Nobody, nobody could explain it. And so because it was one of the first, you know, pensions that was frozen, defined benefit plans, um, you know, that makes a big impact on your life, especially after 15 years. And so Luckily, I was younger. There were a lot of suicides. People lost their homes. I mean, I can't tell you the horrible things that evolved from from a lot of that. So anyway, so I decided, well, let me learn about this. And then when, you know, I read a study right away, you know, as part of my fellowship, and it said that the ba- basically most of the baby boomers were going to be poor by the time they were 80. They would have run out of money. You know, their Social Security won't carry them through. And I'm thinking, that's me. You know, I fit all the little qualities that they're talking about. You know, I got divorced, you know, all these things. Didn't have a pension anymore, really. So, you know, it just it grabbed me. And I remember when, you know, I kept going to Capitol Hill and I got a grant to start Wiser. And what was really funny was there was a famous feminist that came up to me. She'd heard about me and she said, you're going to have a whole like organization around retirement? As if, you know, as if it was just like a little dot. And I said, yeah, I know it's a little crazy, but what can I say? So anyway, that's how Wiser got started. And, you know, the more back then it was a wasteland. There was not one like fact sheet. There was nothing. I mean, the general accounting office did studies about, you know, the poverty among, you know, whatever group was in poverty at that point. But nobody was telling the people. So anyway. Well, to have this focus uh, for so many decades that you have on women's retirement, you know, I often find that takes passion, right? That takes a real passion, a deep-seated passion, something that maybe came out of your childhood, things that you learned from your parents, maybe your mom, your grandmother. What did you glean from the women in your life? Well, I mean, you know, the women in my life were, you know, a generation of women that didn't work. They stayed home, um, you know. They, they weren't paying any attention to money. Um, you know, I learned from my dad, you know, who always worked two jobs. And so I understood, I think, from an early time, my mother had a lot of health issues. And so, you know, he needed and he went back in the military, basically, to, to you know, get her health care um, in the 50s. And so, you know, that's how I learned about money is, you know, like, pay attention, you know, don't, don't pile up a lot of debt. You know, that was never anything that, you know, he would do, but have a good time while you're going. You know what I mean? If there were, it, the one thing I remember, my dad had a great sense of humor was that, you know, if it was the end of the month and he had like 
eight dollars or something my mother wouldn't eat anything like this it was like we were going to the chinese restaurant in the neighborhood you know eh, he gets paid you know like on the first so those kind of those kind of things you know just reminded me about you know like you, you just have to be um you know appropriate with your money like wherever you are and mm-hmm. and know what you have and most people know what they have they don't want to they want to pretend they don't know what they have but they know what they have. If they have nothing, they know they have nothing. So they, they don't want to talk about it. What are some things that you do for the youth in your life to help them build a higher level financial acumen that maybe some of the parents or grandparents listening could be doing for their children or their grandchildren? Yeah, well, I will say that today, um, you know, we're having our college challenge event um, and we don't spend a lot of time with, you know, um, people talking about their grandchildren. Like our focus is there is a huge swath of people that like are not prepared for retirement and they're in their 50s and 60s. And so, you know, no one sits around and says, let's help all those middle aged women, you know, that have not like, you know, found the tools that they need to get going. And that's been a big part of our focus. So a lot of times what we're telling those women is stop giving money to your grandchildren that you don't have, <laughs> you know, they, they can get scholarships. No, don't sign away their on their school loans because nobody else will do it. Their parents won't do it and you're going to do it and you have the least money, you know? So I try to bang their heads a little bit about, you know, putting yourself realizing that you may live to be 95, you know, you're, you're a planner, you know, every, every year that you live, they tell you, you got to save more money because you're going to live longer, you know? Well, easier said than done, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's easy to say those things, but when you're that parent that sees your children struggling, I get it. it's so I get hard it. not to help. No, and, and I, yes, and you can help, but you know, you don't have to become a martyr, you know, like grandma mm. up. So when grandma runs out of money, who's going to be, you know, I always say that to them, who's lining up to help you? Just mm. think of how the line is like outside your door when you don't have any money and you need help. Cause that's how most people end up in their eighties and nineties. You know, you need help, right? Mm-hmm. You need help at home. So who's, who's helping. And it doesn't mean you don't love people. I think it's being, you know, having a reality check. Mm-hmm. So, well, and often what's not recognized is by helping them today, you are burdening them tomorrow with the help that you're going to need down the road as a result. Right. And I'm just saying the numbers are there. You know, the, the, your readers wouldn't want to read these, you know, they think they were boring reports, you know, 50 pages or something from the government accounting office, you know, talking about, um, you know, why women don't have money and, you know, what they're going to need. And so, you know, I also try to convince people Um, And one of my funniest stories was I remember having, you know, get a second job, you know, you, you, you have debt, you can't, you know, you can't, you don't know what you're doing, get a second job, you'll hate it, you know, because you don't want to work any more than you are. And I had someone who was a cameraman, like for a a show that I did. (laughs) He got his mom, he told his mom, showed her the, the tape and all this. She found a job three nights a week at an insurance, uh, I mean, at a a furniture store and hardly anybody came in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So she was getting paid and she could a lot of times sit on the couch and just like do, she went back to school. And, and so the joke was, you know, I said to her, would you rather be working when you're 85 for your medication or looking for a job? Because we have a lot of people that do that as well. Well, let's get back to Wiser for a moment. I, when we look at Wiser, I think it seems fairly self-descriptive, right? A Women's Institute for Secure Retirement. But what would you say is the, the purpose of Wiser? Well, to give people the information, a little bit of what I've been telling you, to wake up and start doing what you need to do, figuring it out. It's not that hard. Um, And, you know, that you're, if whatever you're living on today, if you're 65, you're going to need a lot more than that by the time you're 85. And, you know, I used to worry that people didn't know enough about inflation. I think I can cross that off my list. You know, it's like turn on the TV and try to find a show during the day that won't be talking about inflation, you know, at the moment. Um, So people, people will understand that, but how it relates to them personally, they're learning at the you know, unfortunately, they're having to learn at the gas pump and the grocery store. 
Well, I'd like to ask what Wiser does specifically, but maybe in order to do that, we can ask a different question. That is, you know, what have been the biggest strides or some of the proudest accomplishments that you've had come out of Wiser? Well, because we, this is, we reach the audience of underserved and under-resourced women. That's the punchline. And so with that, we, we operate the National Resource Center on Women in Retirement. That's one of our biggest projects. And we go to a lot of conferences. We have a lot of partners where people know nothing about finances. They don't have access to financial planners. And that's, you know, that's where we reach them. So we, we have a niche that people are always interested in hearing about, especially, you know, in Washington, you know, for congressional hearings, et cetera, because we have the people that are actually in the situation where they maybe took care of their, their older relatives or they did, you know, caregiving and now they don't have enough money for themselves. Um, so we explain all of that to people like these are the barriers for women. This is what you're going to need to do. Um, hopefully you'll be able to get like financial counseling, you know, in your local community of which, you know, there's a lot now. There used to be not very much of that, but there, you know, that's grown over the years. Well, it seems like these conversations have most likely become easier. Things are, people are getting more interested in women's yeah. retirement finance issues. However, that wasn't necessarily the case back in the mid nineties, right? I mean, what, what was it well, like back in 1996 to start gaining some traction? I mean, what's really funny is that in 96, I, uh, 98, I think it was Fortune magazine wanted to do an article because Oppenheimer had done, you know, had done uh, some woman's study. That was one of the first ones. And they were looking for five that were clued in, five companies or, you know, I, we were the only nonprofit pretty much other than AERP, but they didn't do very much on this um, at the time. And so they, they couldn't find five. <laughs> you know what I mean? They had to put in a few people who had written books about divorce or something. So that just shows you it was a wasteland. And then, you know, but what, what's also interesting is that there's so many women over the years that have written to us who, you know, we had a homeless woman who was living in her car and she, she somehow got a hold of our newsletter from somebody and she read this whole article and she just decided, you know what, I'm not living in my car. I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm not feeling sorry. You know, she was victimized in many bad ways. Um, and so I think, you know, there is room for people to grow if they know that this is something that someone's going to be saying, you know, don't give all the money away to the grandkids, don't buy all the Christmas presents and have like new debt added on to old debt that you can't pay already. You know, someone needs to say that other than Susie Orman, you know, yells at people, she's good at doing that. But a lot of, you know, a lot of people don't also want to hear that they want, you know, people say to me all the time, just tell me what to do. That's what they want help with. It's yeah. complicated. Well, and outside of the wage pay gap, that seems like the biggest issue that often comes to the forefront is the pay gap between men and women. But beyond that, what, what are some of the biggest disadvantages that women have when it comes to retirement specifically? Yeah, I mean, it's caregiving. That's huge now. I mean, that is almost like the number one topic when employers, you know, talk to their employees about like, what, what are the issues for women? It's, it's also, you know, caregiving causes a lot of women to stay out of the workforce for periods of time. Um, you know, I, I always say, you know, the pay gap is one thing, but, you know, um, and, and it's not that it doesn't matter, but here, here's something I find interesting. I go to a conference where there are a lot of, you know, basically uh, median income women, you know, like in the, they're earning in the 40s or maybe 50. And a lot of older women, and there's a hundred something women in the audience. So these, you know, these are workers like that help, you know, Meals on Wheels or do, you know, they do programs for elderly people. And I say to them, how many of you have a retirement plan? No, nope. nobody wants to hear about it. All they want to talk about is the pay gap. And I say, well, that's nice. There is a pay gap. I've suffered through it most of my life, but it didn't prevent me from saving, <laughs> doing once I figured it out, you know, that I better skedaddle here and like, you know, hop on it because I already lost 15 years with that other, you know, frozen in, in the freezer pension. So. 
what do you, let's talk about the pay gap for a little bit. Why do you think there is a pay gap? There could be some obvious reasons there, but what are some maybe other nuanced reasons? And maybe even further beyond that, what could women do in the workforce to decrease that? I mean, look, those issues are complicated because in the old days, when, when the pay gap first started, and I know the widow of the man who started doing the lawsuits, it was pretty easy. You and I are doing the same job and we're sitting at you know desks next to each other and you have children and I'm not getting paid what you're getting paid. I mean, it was easy. You know what I mean? Those first lawsuits were so blatant. Um, it's much more complicated today. And so, you know, I think so many more opportunities for women than, you know, when I was getting out of college, um, you know, just amazing opportunities. And it's, if you can, not getting stuck and realizing that you can do something about your situation. Um, because in my lifetime, is it going to catch up? I don't know. It's 82 cents on the dollar right now, but not everybody is making that 82 cents. You know, that's the, the math there. Um, and so I, I think it, it's hard because it's the occupations that women work in. Then, you know, look at all the nurses that are leaving now and they, they get paid mm -hmm much better than they ever did. Um, that's been one of the occupations that, you know, women finally were getting paid. They're not becoming millionaires, but they were getting paid a better wage than the average school teacher was even. So, you know, it, it, it just depends. I think where you work, what you're doing, whether you have a plan. If I had never left that company and I'd never gone back to school, I'd be in, you know, I'd be in trouble. Um, I know that, you know what I mean? I was living in a really expensive city, so I moved someplace else. It was much cheaper. I could buy a house, you know, all those things that, um, and, and those situations change, you know, that, that instruction doesn't help, you know, a lot of women today, you know, but I heard yesterday the prices of houses are going to start shooting down. I don't know if that's going to make people that just paid a lot of money for their houses happy, but <laughs> it just means more people will be able to buy homes at some point in the near future. So, Well, it seems like there's a lot of focus on the disadvantages that women have around finances, investing, money, retirement. However, I've interviewed a lot of strong, powerful women that have shared, well, women have a lot of advantages at the same time. What are some of the advantages in your mind that women have over men? Well, I think they're, they're, they're educating themselves more than men. Um, but, you know, it's the, it's the family issues that still drag women down. And it's not that I think every woman, you know, in the country is poor. I just, a lot of, a lot of the women that I've helped over the years were financial planners. You know what I mean? They became my sisterhood because when I first was going out there talking about, I was horrified. Like, really, I don't want to be poor. I don't want everybody else I know to be poor either. And yet that's where the statistics were. And you would hear from the expert researchers, well, it's always been like that. Well, you know, we kind of have to do something about that. And that I think, you know, a lot of women know that they have to be doing something for their retirement. It's like one of the top things they talk about. They're all worried about it. Um, there are more confident women um, but the other thing is that, you know, women don't take action because they put their family first. They put lots of other people first before themselves. So, well, Cindy, I think you're due for another booklet around what women need to know about their finances. You released one back in 1998, what every woman needs to know about money and retirement, a simple guide. And now that it's been over two decades, what new information would you add to that to, to provide further insight to that issue? Well, basically, that booklet still stands up, and we still use that, um, interestingly enough. But as I said, it's the caregiving. It's the staying out of the workforce. Um, it's, it's making those, uh, putting your eggs in someone else's basket. Divorce, you know, divorce is much bigger um, uh, numbers than there were, you know, in 96, obviously. Um, and so, you know, and it's also being smart about it and taking charge. A lot of women that we know that are in trouble come because they've given up the pension, they kept, kept the house. I'm sure you know a lot of those stories yourself. Um, and so we try to get women to make the, you know, better choices again. Um, and I have to be careful because there are certain populations, you know, I remember being on a, a Native American reservation in Montana, um, you know, probably in the early um, uh, 2000. 
and um, you know, not talking the way I'm talking to you, like don't give money to your grandchildren if you don't have it. But you know, just saying, you know, like you want people to stay on the reservation. These are the, you know the things you have to do and do for yourself and blah blah and everything. And and you know, somebody stood up and said, "Yep, yeah, but our whole culture is built about giving all our money away to our children." You know, what do we do about that? So. Well, it depends on your children, I guess, and what they're doing and whether they're going to school. You know, everybody has a lot of those issues. But I think you, you deserve to have food on your table when you're in your 80s and 90s and not have to be begging for it, you know, from other family members. So. Well, and that is it's personal, but it's cultural at the same time. This idea of caregiving that, you know, there's many more men that are becoming stay at home dads than at ever any other time throughout history. Uh, if someone wants to be that stay at home person, I've got a close friend of mine who uh, is now earning a little bit more. Now his wife wants to be a stay at home mom, and that's what she's always wanted to do. She wants to be a stay at home mom. She doesn't want to work. She wants to be, she wants to take care of the household. What would your advice be to her? as she enters that stage i would say redo that family budget and that there you know there's an ira that you can you can be funding every year for yourself <laughs> you know the family make that part of the budget that's what i would mm -hmm. do yeah well, and I, think, and I think that's important you know um i mean a lot of women don't know about that but you know that way um you know if and and it sounds pessimistic i'm very optimistic about people's lives and all of that you know sometimes people end up being great greater friends and better parents when they do get divorced you know things just stranger things happen but you need to take care of yourself if you're putting all your eggs in somebody else's basket and you're not earning you need everybody needs to be saving money for themselves you know what i mean so part of the family budget can go into that ira well, and what about the level of involvement and in the finances and the financial planning that, that itself? You know, in yeah. this instance, she has no interest in the finances. She says, you know, he, he oh, Zach's going to handle all of the finances, right? Or, or Eric's going to handle all of the finances. So, you know, I want my husband to handle these things. That's his world, not mine. You know, what is, um, is it practical for a woman to think that they can rely on the man in their life to take care of all their finances? Well, I think they can if they're piling it up in the IRA. <laughs> you know, that, that's what I think, because then you have something to fall back on. I've just seen too many women um, and women that were part of the financial industry or the insurance industry going through a divorce and not even having like the basic to go get a lawyer. You know, you, they, they don't come free. You have to put mm. down some kind of a retainer when you even get a divorce lawyer. So the point is, you never want to be in that situation and you love somebody, you're married, you know what I mean? You do it now, just like you should be planning, you know, a guardian for your kids. Nobody wants to do that. But, you know, what if two people get in a car accident and, you know, something horrible happens? You need to have your paperwork in place. So I, we try to tell women that, you know, in that way that you're really just being prepared. You know, well, it's like... The man in their life can be doing all that preparation. It can be assisting in making sure that there has there are assets being set aside, the estate plan is in place, and all the appropriate documentation, et cetera, is all taken care of. Um, but is that okay? You know, does the woman not need to be involved in that planning? Do they need to come to the financial planning meetings with their advisor? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think they should be there. I mean, I, I know those stories, too. A lot of women don't. I don't care. He's going to take care of it. But we, we also did this booklet uh, about a year and a half ago called Going It Alone. And it's like, you know, about 20 pages full of like what you need to do when you, you know, are older and you're widowed and, you know, like all the all the different pieces you need to know about. Like if you were looking for the pension like me, you know, if I if I had a spouse who was looking for the pension, where would you go to find that? You know, like I know mm -hmm. she had some kind of a pension there. I don't think it was very much, but that kind of thing. So, you know, eventually you're going to have to deal with this. So you need to know, at least go to those meetings and not be reading your book. I've heard those stories. <laughs> I want to just, you know, whatever. And I, you know, we just I, had one of those. There was a gal that was in the meeting. He drug her to the meeting. She didn't want to be in the meeting. And she was playing a game on her phone for an hour during the meeting. The whole time she's sitting there on the phone playing some game, word, words with friends or something. And we're going, oh, we just, we want you to get involved. And he desperately wanted to get her involved as well. I know. He wanted her in the conversation. Yeah. And then she leaves and he says, how can I get her more involved in the conversation? What would you say to him? 
look, you can only do what you can do. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it, it's uh, credit to him that he's like bringing her to the meeting. And I would be furious if I were sitting there with somebody playing games <laughs> while we're paying for this, you know. So, I mean, it's, it, it is. It's, it's ridiculous. I, I have one cute story that I love is we had a uh, grant from FINRA at some point to do a project on nurses. And so we trained nurses to do like the programs that we do in six states. We had these two nurses up in Maine and they were older, you know, um, and so they would have like parties. The nurses would come to their house and then they would practice doing the thing, you know, whatever, what, the wiser program. And the funniest thing was this one of the nurses, her husband started leaving her little articles from the Wall Street Journal on her pillow because he'd been waiting his whole life for her to ever have any interest. And now she was speaking the language. She was asking him questions and all of that. So. That's you know, great. Make it these happen. subtle cues, right? We don't necessarily have to be overt. Just, just drop those things in. Send a podcast like this, right? Or drop an article on the pillow. Exactly. Uh, that's fantastic. Exactly. Now, what should, are there some things that you believe a woman should expect from their financial advisor, uh, maybe that are different than what a man might expect? Well, here, here's, look, I think it's a matter of experience. And, and I, I think people don't want all the lingo. And I say that all the time, you know what I mean? Like there's always new lingo and, you know, I do a lot with the industry and, you know, there's always some new thing coming up and, you know, being a headline, I'll have to go look and see what do those initials even mean? And it was in a headline in a place where real people, I never even heard of it, you know? So the point is plain language, telling people what they want to, you know, what they want to hear, like, am I going to have enough money? What are we doing here? You know, what does a financial planner do for you? And I, I have another quick story. Um, if, if I'm doing too many stories, tell me, you know, that's bad. But I had family come out during the pandemic um, to visit me for a funeral in the area. And so my cousin's wife was telling me that oh, she really disliked the, the planner that they just got. And her husband, who doesn't know one third of what she knows, my cousin, He's he said, oh, he's a really nice guy. It's the first client. So he's telling her she's already got three pensions and he's telling her to take whatever her cash account is and put it in an annuity. So she was furious. You know, she said he never listened to me. I'm just telling the story about what he you know, whether you wanted to do it or not do it is fine. You know, um, that decision, because everybody, you know, people make up their mind or they hear something they want to do it. Look, that that's their lesson that they're going to have to learn if they won't listen to anyone, you know. But the point was that she had enough money coming in with her Social Security, with these three pensions, because she worked in different hospitals, you know, for periods of time. She was retiring at 68. So anyway, the point is that young person probably didn't have enough experience for, for her needs. So she would, you know, she wouldn't go to any more meetings with him. And finally, they got somebody else. So look for someone that has not just experience, but someone that can actually speak the language, right? Someone that can simplify some of these complex topics. Right. And, you know, I, I've always, believe it or not, running a women's organization and all that, it's like all my doctors have always been men. You know what I mean? It's like I have a financial planner that was assigned to me because of where, you know, my, like the, where my money is. And it's a man. It's fine. You know, I, I think if that person talks to you and understands, it doesn't matter, you know what I mean, to a lot of people. It, it isn't just the maleness that like women don't like. It's either they don't ask the right questions or they don't respect, you know, like sort of the situation. Um, maybe they're taking care of the mother and the mother-in-law. You know, nobody's talking about that. Where's the money coming from, from, from doing that, you know, getting home health care to take care of, you know, people in different ways. So I, I th that's the biggest complaint I hear from women is that, you know, they, they're not listening or they're not in tune. And here's what else is interesting. When I've done for different companies, I've done, um, you know, sessions, uh, you know, like a, an hour session on caregiving. Like it's almost all the men that sign up. All the financial planners are, are men. You know, there's maybe six women, you know, and and it may be because the women already know all those issues because they've been dealing with it, you know, with their family or whatever. But the guys are, you know, they listen and they pay attention. And, I, you know, some of them I stay in touch with and they're they're happy to to, to know what they need to be doing. They, they want to help. They're in the business to help people. 
Sure. Right. Well, let's talk about some of the things that are happening in Washington right now, some of your major initiatives. This past March, you spoke before the U.S. Senate Committee on how to improve retirement and enhance strategies, particularly for women. What was the biggest takeaway that you hope to relay from that hearing? Well, I mean, I think one of the issues for, for that, um, and by the way, right now there's a markup on Capitol Hill this morning, a lot happening on this day, um, and three retirement bills are being squished into, you know, they'll have to go to the, the two committees, we'll have to get together, the House and the Senate, to like change, a lot of the provisions are the same, uh, I mean, are similar, you know, in these three bills, but they're going to have to be like, you know, merged together. So, um, and that's going to probably happen. And that bill will pass before the end of the year, I'm pretty sure. But I'll I'll use a simple example is that like there, you know, there's a bill about getting part-time workers into the retirement plan where you work. And, um, you know, that there's numbers there on how many women will be helped. And, you know, a lot of times part-time workers don't stay three years. So, you know, it's been moved down to two years. But a lot of the younger people, they just change job to job. You know, if they're, they're, they're like a long timer, if you can get them for, for, two, for two years. Um, so it, it's pieces like that that, you know, that can actually help a lot of women because women are twice as likely as men to work part time. Well, you've been a bit, big advocate specifically on one particular issue that I've seen you talk on a few times, and that is uh, rollovers, 401k rollovers from a past employer. Can you speak to that for a moment? Yep. Well, there's something called auto portability. And I think, you know, will happen because a number of the big, the big financial industry firms are like behind it. Um, And it would put like, I don't know, one to $3 trillion back in, you know, in the, in the retirement system, instead of having people change a job, just um, the rollover process is not easy. I know, I know all the advertisements say it's easy. It's not easy for the average person, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's difficult. And well, we're uh, talking about automatic portability here, right? So right, let's say right. I'm saying, I have so a job. Just, right. But it, the companies have to be willing to do it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? They have to adopt the auto portability. And so, does that mean when I leave an employer with where I had a 401k and I come into a new employer, sign up for their 401k, my 401k will automatically transfer over without me happen. having to do anything? Yep be like and, social security it'd be like a smooth and what smooth. if i don't want to do that i mean, i can see well, this because, being an you know issue you, you have to you have to sign the paperwork saying that you want to do that anyway i mean the employer has the opportunity to do that and you can and a lot of times what happens is people lose track of their account you know they don't even remember like they didn't think they had so much money sometimes people don't even know they're in the 401k because they were automatically enrolled Mm -hmm. So then they cash out, then they have to pay taxes, you know, there's, it's not fun when they find out they have to pay taxes, believe me, I, I, I discouraged a friend who was turning 70 and retired, um, and his 401k had been going down since January 1st, so he said, I'm just cashing out the whole thing, I don't care, he, he had more money than he should have to be cashing out, and I said, well, well, let me tell you what your tax bill is going to be, that discouraged that, so, Mm -hmm. you know, To me, this seems like a minor issue in the grand scheme of things. I can roll over my 401k to an employer. I can roll it out to an IRA. I mean, aren't there bigger issues? We're we're more concerned about all the people in the middle that don't know any of that, who just like cash it out. Um, And, you know, look, having somebody like be able to build an account, you know, or to have an account like, you know, at the new job, taking the old money, putting that in and having it grow in one place. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're the person that's investing the money, you may not like it as much um, as for the situation, but you know, it, it makes a huge difference. Well, I can huge. see it making an impact. There's no question about that. I just, it seems like this is just how things go in Washington. You know a lot about more about how things go and turn over and get created in Washington than I do. Uh, but it seems like we set out with these big initiatives and they turn into something much smaller at the very end of the day. Uh, I imagine oh. this for you, you go, this is very impactful, but I bet there's some higher level things, some some big goals that you have for wiser and missions that you would like to see accomplished yes. in Washington. What are some of those bigger things that you hope to see down the road? Well, I mean, the thing is that everybody would have like, 
some sort of a benefit at their job. That's the biggest thing of all, because we have half the workforce with nothing. And, you know, nobody wants to hear me, you know, come out there, um, you know, when I when I talk to large groups of people, they don't want to hear, oh, you know, like half the workforce doesn't, you know, you, you have to talk to people in a more positive way. Um, and, and it's also interesting to me because I don't expect that every employer has to solve the problem that, you know, either the government, either that, you know, there should, everybody has tried to talk about this since ERISA was passed, which was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So we haven't solved yeah. it yet. So I, I let myself off the hook that, you know, I may not be able to accomplish this. So mm -hmm. what I can do is tell these women what they need to do. They either need to have a Roth IRA. They need to do something. You know, they, they need to find out what they have at the job. And a lot of times women ignore that. They don't even know that they, they have that. Well, there's probably two different types of people that are listening. There's some that want to get involved in the issue and to further your mission over at Wiser. There's others that say, oh, I really want to get started in better getting a grasp on my personal finances. What are the good first steps for those types of individuals? Well, I, I think, look, a lot of the problem is finding a place for them to put the money. And that may seem absurd to somebody like you who does that for a living, but it's not easy. <laughs> You know what I mean? Every Everybody thinks it's so easy. Oh, well, they can just, yeah, well, they can just. These are not people that know how to do this. Mm -hmm. that, that's what we try to do, yeah. you know. Let's talk about that for a moment because I am, I, I mean, I've had that reaction, right? So they came up with the whole IRA for everyone, right? They're rah, rah. And it's like, okay, Mine, great. Now everybody can open an IRA. I mean, well, everybody can already open an IRA. Just go to your bank or hop online, open an IRA. What, what, what could be changed that would make that easier? Because they're always, we're always going to have to take action to open those accounts, right? Is there some method that you're thinking of that would automatically open retirement accounts for everyone, say when they're born or? Yeah, I, I don't love that either. For some reason, I, I you know, it's a, it's a very expensive possibility. I, I mean, and there are a lot of people that want that, you know what I mean, the IRA, whatever, but it doesn't help my middle aged women that have been, you know, raising kids and doing all sorts of other things, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, does, doesn't help them. Um, yeah, it's kind of like Social Security, right? I mean, we, we expect right, Social Security right. to, be, and, to right. be that then, tool. That is, that is a big part of it. But let me just tell you the Maya Ray story and what happened with that. So I heard this from the industry, but that's because they don't know that, you know, I want to give them some of these women and say, yes, take this woman. And you think when, when I ask women at a session, I'll, I'll name three big com companies and I'll tell you this when we're not on the air. <laughs> and and do, does anybody ever know about these things? No, they look at me like, no, never heard of them. You know, and, and what the industry people will tell me is that's because they don't watch enough football games or something, or that's where, <laughs> that's where the advertisements are for the finance. Now, now there are more financial, you know, I think there's a lot of everything on there. There's more on the internet, but with, here's what, with the Maya Ray, no fees. And it was an automatic sign up. You could take your money and instead of, you know, spending it or paying taxes or whatever, you could put it in the Maya Ray. The problem was that there was a lot of dissension about that from the beginning. Mm. So in the Treasury Department, you know, this is a government agency like any other agency, it's some people wanted to see it succeed, some people didn't. You know, I had been suggesting hold a meeting at the Treasury Department, get all the nonprofits in DC that don't have anything that they're offering to people who work there for a long time. And tell them about it and they'll sign up because we used to get people to sign up for I bonds, you know, mm -hmm. like back in the, you know, early two thousands when that came out because the interest rate was pretty high, just like it is now. Um, and then, you know, wall street was buying up the I bonds and then, you know, none of my women, nobody ever heard about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? At that point, because it became a high level, you know, item, just like you're saying. So it's just the world we live in. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't get angry at bad actors or whatever it is. It is what it is. You know, mm -hmm. we try to keep the grandmas from getting scammed uh, of which that's a, another huge issue. Um, and if people can preserve that $5,000, if I showed you statistics, I could convert you, but you know, you'd have to read all those boring statistics, you know, about who doesn't have the money, who spends it. That's why auto portability is really, um, I mean, I was able to convince a lot of people that, 
you know, they'd be like, save $5,000. Like, really? Who cares? You know, $5,000, what's that going to do you? For a lot of people, that's like the, you know, that's like having a million dollars in the bank. Mm. They never have that. Mm -hmm. so. Well, let me finish with a couple philosophical questions here. Uh, what do you hope to see as absurd 25 years from now? Say that again. I'm sorry. You dropped. If we fast forward 25 years, what would you yeah. hope to see as absurd? You know what? I, I would hope that people just like automatically save. It's like Social Security and you've got some other account. You know what I mean? That it, that That is saved for retirement and it supplements it. That's all. Well, it, it seems like that's the major initiative for you, right, is to right. get people saving. And that is done through education and then right. some of these other tools that you're trying to get in the hands of beginning savers. Right. Yeah. Right. And here, here's the interesting thing. I've, I've done programs in D.C. with inner city kids. This is and I love this. So I go, you know, with like one of my colleagues and um, and, you know, we talk to these kids about, look, you're, you're getting your GED, you're going to get a job because they like help these kids get jobs. And this is what we're here to tell you when you get your job, whatever. Show them the chart, you know, the chart, you start saving in your 20s, right, 2000, whatever. These kids are a riot. It, the, the, what people spend on 401k education, you know what I mean? Like these kids could say, oh, we'll tell you how to do it in about two minutes. Show that chart. Tell us what we're supposed to be looking for at a job. And I've, you know, seen so many good success stories. Kids will come back to me and say, hey, my cousin works at the water department in D.C. He says they got one of those K things you were talking about. Should I? He can get me a job. Yeah, get you a job. That's your first job. You go in, you whatever. I'm just I'm saying it's like, you know, people don't know this. They don't sit around the table. Their family doesn't tell them, you know, like what to do. So I get enthused about that because I met this kid one day on the Metro who's saying to me that he's got a couple of thousand dollars he's on he's going on the longest train ride into virginia but he had the information and he's telling me how much he's gotten his 401k he's tapping my leg like he remembers me sees me you know and i'm looking at him like here's this young kid you know tapping my knee he's trying to get my attention because we're sitting close together anyway it was a great story i love it you know what i mean because that changes his life and he knows it sure well, you're changing lives and you, yeah, you have one a person at a time. And I'm not telling it for that. I'm really saying it for more that I, I've also had the, the young man on um, uh, and, and it's a true story, financial habits, one of these like apps that you have on, you know, mm -hmm. that you can sign up and get a Roth IRA. He was at Goldman Sachs. He graduated from MIT. His father graduated from MIT. He was never in the 401k, like somehow, either with the paperwork, you know, he never paid any attention. He didn't know he never signed up. That's why he started that. And it was unbelievable because everybody, all his teammates are sitting around talking about how much money they just made in the stock market. He doesn't know what they're talking about. So that's what I, you know, I don't want people to take for granted. I'm saying like there are millions of people out there that didn't go to MIT that don't know any of them. We obviously have a lot of passion around the subject. You're living a life of purpose. You can Sorry. see it in your face. What does retire with purpose mean to you? Well, having, you know, being successful at being able to go to the store and buy like what you need to buy. Mm -hmm. We live in a, you know, capitalist country, right? So, you know, you want to, <laughs> you need capital. You need, to, you need to have money to pay for what you want and your medication, you know, I always say by the time I'm in my 80s, I'm going to really be cranky. And so I'll need to be able to pay for those cranky pills, whatever they'll give me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, Cindy, thanks so much for joining us here. I, what, what are some resources that you could give back to the audience where they might be able to dive a little bit deeper? Um, well, I, I think we have a great website because people come to it because they want to find what they want to find, divorce, widowhood, you know, whatever. And so wiserwomen.org. Um, is the um, is the website. And then, you know, we also have an info at Wiser Women, which means that um, people can write to that and we can get you an expert and get you help. Um, and w the other thing that um, since I did babble about that, the financial um, caregiving hub um, is new. And we have a lot of information about that, about how you know, caregivers can take care of themselves while they're taking care of other people because a lot of times they leave their job 
give up a lot of benefits. Don't pay any attention to that. Just, you know, go to the emergency of taking care of the person that needs to be taken care of. Well, you're clearly already and going to continue to make a big impact in a lot of lives. Thank you so much for joining us here on the show, Cindy. We'll make sure to drop all of those uh, resources and links right in the show notes. You can catch it at retirewithpurpose.com. Thanks, Cindy. All right. Thank you.